engineering obviously being an, a very clear example of an occupation where you need to be good at systemizing. And we found a, a, an elevated rate of fathers and grandfathers on both sides of the family of children with autism who worked in engineering compared to uh, men in the general population or um, uh, related to children with a different disability. So it suggests that people um, in earlier generations in the family who may have the broader autism phenotype may not have a diagnosis, indeed uh, often don't have a diagnosis, but may show um, a mild version of um, similar pattern of traits as the person uh, with the diagnosis in their family. We see this link between autistic traits and systemizing in this one study where we use the autism spectrum quotient, a dimensional approach to counting how many autistic traits an individual has. You can see that this is broadly normally distributed and people with a diagnosis simply score higher. Um, but what we notice is that students in mathematics um, score intermediate between typical um, individuals in the population and people with uh, a diagnosis on the autistic spectrum. So we're seeing an association between a, t a talent in understanding, in this case, a numerical system, mathematical system, and the number of autistic traits a person has. Going back to our candidate um, hormonal factor, fetal testosterone, in that longitudinal study where we've been able to follow children whose mothers had amniocentesis, where we have measured the amount of testosterone that the fetus was producing, we can look to see is there any relationship between fetal testosterone and the second factor, systemizing. What we see now is a positive correlation. So the line is sloping upwards, meaning the higher your testosterone, the stronger your interest in systems amongst typically developing children who we've had the opportunity to study to look for hormone behavior correlations. And interestingly, in that same sample, where we can now test them at age eight years old, using the embedded figures test, that test of attention to detail, the faster and more accurate you are in finding the target shape hidden in the overall design, this test on which children with autism perform very well, we see this correlation with fetal testosterone, that the higher the child's fetal testosterone, the better they're performing on this test of attention to detail. So this is an effort to step away from diagnosis and look at individual differences in the population on these dimensions of empathy and systemizing. And now, in on using three different measures, I'm just showing two of them here, looking at the number of autistic traits a child has in relation to their fetal testosterone level. We can see that whether the parent is filling in the child AQ about their child, or up here, just published this year, um, the QChat, the quantitative checklist for autism in toddlers, uh, we see this positive correlation with fetal testosterone, that the higher the child's testosterone levels, the higher the number of autistic traits as rated later in development. These children are now old enough to go into the scanner, so as well as being able to measure their hormone levels in utero, we can also now start to look at um, structural and functional aspects of their brain. And we just published last year the first um, study looking at correlations between fetal testosterone and uh, regions in the brain in terms of volume. Here we picked out the corpus callosum just because it's been reported for many decades to show sex differences in the general population just in the posterior section of the corpus callosum and found that in these children whose amniotic testosterone is known, a positive correlation with rightward asymmetry just in the posterior section of the corpus callosum. So the higher your testosterone in utero, the larger that section just at the back of the corpus callosum. 
the connective tissue between two hemispheres. And we're going on to look at, um, at the whole brain using VBM um, to look at vo the volume of uh, different regions in the brain in terms of um, fetal testosterone associations. So because we're running a bit late, I'm going to skip some slides to draw to conclusion that I've described um, a two-factor model of, uh, at, at the psychological level of autism spectrum conditions, suggesting that we all, we all fall on these two dimensions in the population somewhere, but that people with autism may be below average on, or on the low side on empathy, whereas on the, in systemizing they may be either average or even above average in terms of the strength of their systemizing. It's not very um, satisfying to be considering people's scores on two separate dimensions. So our model tries to combine these two dimensions, still assuming that they're independent, uh, plotting them like this. So we've got empathy along the y-axis and systemizing along the x-axis. And if we regard these, if we regard zero, meaning you're absolutely average, and these are like standard deviations above or below the mean, what we've been finding is that um, in terms of the general population, more females than males seem to fall in this light blue area where their empathy is at a slightly higher level than their systemizing. More males in the population seem to fall here where their systemizing is at a slightly higher level than their empathy. Many people are right in the middle here where they show no discrepancy between the two domains. They're as good or as bad in terms of their skills in both domains. But people on the autistic spectrum seem to be in this dark red zone where their empathy is below average, so here at least minus one but their systemizing could be anywhere from average through to superior. And seen in this way, we can think of autistic traits as running along this diagonal, where the two-factor model is encompassed in this space, and the challenge for biological research is whether we need to identify separate causes contributing to each of these two factors, or whether there is still the possibility of a single factor that unites these two. Um, I want to finish by mentioning that we've um, tried to address how we can use the model educationally in children with autism um, by producing an animation DVD for young children with autism to try to teach empathy uh, in a very systemizing framework so we've put faces of actors showing different emotions onto vehicles. This is a still photograph, but the, um, the movie obviously is an animation. And children watch vehicles with the wheels going round in highly systematic patterns, going along tracks, uh, like train tracks or trams or cable cars, uh, so they can enjoy the systematic properties of the characters. And what we found is that uh, simply by encouraging children with autism to watch the movie for 15 minutes a day over a one-month period, you see significant improvement in children on the autistic spectrum who, who watch the DVD versus a matched group of children with autism um, who, um, who don't have an opportunity to watch the DVD. In green here are the typical group and you can see that in this study, just in terms of emotion recognition, children with Asperger's syndrome caught up to typical levels um, in terms of emotion recognition. These were a group of five to eight-year-old children. I don't want to claim any, um, any magic cure here because all this is showing is that with opportunities for practice and learning, there is certainly room for improvement in terms of empathy. So I'm going to finish with some conclusions. Firstly, that we might be able to characterize individuals on the autistic spectrum in terms of their discrepancy between their scores in empathy and their scores in systemizing. Below average empathy 
and intact or even above average systemizing. So the issue is not about your absolute scores in one or the other domain, but about your difference. Secondly, that uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of new evidence towards the biological underpinnings of empathy, both in terms of brain, uh, brain function, um, hormones, and genetics. The biology of systemizing is still relatively un unexplored, and we need more research in that area. And finally, that what we're finding is that typical sex differences in empathy and systemizing are particularly associated with a single factor, fetal testosterone, um, suggesting that although these two dimensions may have some independence, they may not be completely independent if we're finding them both mapping onto uh, a single underlying factor. I don't want to argue that fetal testosterone is the only factor because we know that other hormones, for example oxytocin, also correlate with performance on empathy. Uh, and I'm um, confident that autism is going to be multifactorial, but this particular hormone, fetal testosterone, may be one part of the puzzle. And I'm going to finish by inviting you to visit our website and thank the funding agencies who support this research. Thank you.